We've got a very um, interesting couple of sections from a, a fantastic video um, called Evolution's Achilles Heels. Um, some of you may have already seen it, um, but um, we'll have a look at that in a moment. So when we read, and we read Genesis chapter 1 last week, Genesis chapter 2 this week, um, by all means it reads as a factual account, something that actually happened, well that's at least the impression that a very simple reading of this section would give. And the Bible, as we all know, absolutely puts forward this account as the way <clears throat> that God created and the events that are recorded here, uh, we're led to believe that they literally did happen. So of all the different ways that you can um, interpret and, and try to explain the, the wonderful things that we see around us in creation, the Bible has one explanation and of course the um, opposing view is that of evolution, that I guess everything arose from uh, a soup of special ingredients and some mystical elements that formed the first life which gradually has been on its way upward, um, microbes to mankind if you like. And when you look at the earth, when you look at creation and, and all the intricacy and the wonder of it, you can't help but be amazed and, and even hardened atheists have to I guess restrain themselves in their, in their wonder and um, the obvious which is that it was all designed and created and they resist that because it just doesn't seem simple, it doesn't seem, um, it seems too simple if you like um, and there's obviously other reasons as well. And then of course there's a third viewpoint which tries to merge the two together, that old theistic evolution um, where God perhaps kick-started the evolutionary process and um, life has continued since then. A theory which may seem at first to be um, great, but it poses many problems, uh, in particular with the first few chapters of the Bible and the very foundation of the message that it contains. So, as we said, the Bible pretty much adamantly can, uh, proclaims that God created. He did it. It was him that was behind it all. And as we saw last time, last week, God created it all with a purpose. He has a purpose in mind. It's not just that we exist for no reason. He's very interested in what's going to happen in the future. And there's, there's many passages in the Bible which would, to any simple-minded person, read as though the person who's, you know, the people who wrote the New Testament and sections of it that we've taken here really did believe that God actually did create and the events in Genesis really did happen. You know, man, God made man male and female in the beginning, Matthew chapter 19, the words of Christ, the words of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. You know, the, the serpents mentioned in 2 Corinthians 11, um, <clears throat> the genealogy of Jesus is traced right back through all the, you know, the human uh, ancestors that he had right back to Adam. I mean, if, if that's not talking about a literal person, then, you know, where does this, you know, supposed myth end and, and, and reality begin? It's very difficult to, to hold that view if you, if you accept the Bible's authority. 1 Timothy 2, Adam and Eve again, and the temptation in the garden, they're all taken as factual, literal things that really happened. And there's references to Noah and the, and the flood, uh, Abraham, Joseph, all the characters, the main characters in the book of Genesis are all referenced by people later in the Old Testament and through the New Testament as well. So there's no real easy way to, to get around the fact that the, the account that we just had read for us tonight really did happen, or so the Bible claims. And the Bible, Matt's already alluded to it, he's kind of stolen some of my thunder in his opening prayer, but that's okay. Um, Romans chapter 1 is incredibly blunt. Like, the Bible does not make apologies. It doesn't, you know, sort of say it in an embarrassed sort of tone, you know, like, you know, I know it's a bit unbelievable, but really this is what happened. It, it hits you right between the eyes. And Romans chapter 1, not only does it claim that, you know, God created, but also it says that People who don't believe that have got no excuse. It is so obvious from looking at creation that God made it that you have got no excuse 
to accept any other alternative. Now, of course, on the, uh, on the other side, you know, pretty much the whole scientific community, I mean, obviously there's an exception, a small exception, but many scientists are dead against any form of supernatural intervention. Um, <clears throat> and this is just one small example from a Wikipedia article. It talks about the scientific community um, scoffing and laughing at this movement called intelligent design, which uh, argues for um, a creator as having um, influence in, in the way, in the world that we see around us today. And they, they laugh at it as unscientific, as pseudoscience or junk science, as it says there. Uh, and, and, you know, all the credentials are rolled out, all these amazing institutions which support evolution and, and laugh at, at, at the, um, intelligent design. Um, and then they've got some statistics there. 97% of all scientists say that humans and other living things have evolved. And 87% say evolution is due to natural processes, such as natural selection, and so on and so forth. And actually, the interesting thing at the end there is that uh, only about a third of the public, as of 2009, actually believe what scientists tell them, uh, in the US, of course. Um, and we're going to see tonight that that last paragraph there, which talks about... Um, the section which talks about evolution is due to natural processes such as natural selection. It's interesting to note that, that many um, Christian scientists who, who do not accept evolution, they accept that natural selection is actually something which operates in the natural world. But I guess it, um, in a different way to what evolutionists would have us believe. In fact, it, they claim that it actually strips away information and discards rather than adding new information. And we'll see, we'll see some, um, a section out of the video which, which talks about that in more detail. So we have a, a kind of dilemma, don't we? If, if we were trying to discover the truth for ourselves, on the one hand we have this almost childishly simple explanation for how life came to be. And then we have the whole intelligentsia, almost, the scientific community telling us that you know, this is a book for a full of fairy tales that's, that's just laughable. It has no um, reflection in reality. So where do we go? I guess the easy choice is to go with the smart people. But, you know, can, can it be, can it really be that so many scientists could have it so wrong? I mean, it's very easy to see why people today don't think the Bible's particularly relevant. Um, everything seems stacked against it. And uh, I guess um, <clears throat> for many people it's just such an incredible challenge. It's a wonder that anyone comes to the conclusion that God actually created. And it's remarkable that we have events like this morning with, with our new brother James accepting the message of the Bible as authentic and genuine. It's a wonderful thing in an age of, of reason and cold logic which despises anything that God puts forward. I just want to talk for a minute on science itself. Um, it's good to, to think about science as, a, as an institution and as a, as a movement. Um, <clears throat> it is actually credited, we can credit it with a, you know, the large number of, of advances we have in our society. We can't you know, swing the other way as Bible believers and despise everything that science has because clearly there's massive benefits that science has brought and it's stripped away a lot of the superstition involved in you know natural phenomena that otherwise we might have thought you know or people in the in the in days gone by thought that you know gods were hurling thunderbolts from the skies when they were angry when when lightning storms happened and you know the rumble of thunder was was god expressing his disapproval all sorts of of bizarre interpretations of nature have been explained and clarified for us and we can see that it's all part of a wonderful system that God has created. And scientists are able to actually do something incredibly powerful. They can, and they have, derived universal laws which describe the forces and the, and the principles that, that nature exists with and it allows them to very accurately predict the behaviour of things that 
um, that they can't actually even measure. You know, like they can predict how things are going to behave in the in the centre of the sun, for example, where they can't exactly set up a laboratory. Because of these formula and the and the precise and the predictable way that nature behaves, scientists have been able to progress and advance in leaps and bounds in recent years. And yet, it's I still find this absolutely incredible. You know, a scientist can describe down to the letter exactly how energy behaves in a particular situation and, and predict it down to the, you know, the, the minutest level of accuracy. And yet, when it comes to energy, despite knowing exactly how it will behave, they've still got no idea what it actually is. They don't understand what energy actually is. They don't know why there's a limited amount of energy in the universe and they don't know where it came from. No explanation. None whatsoever. And you know, you could say the same for other phenomena like light and gravity. These, you know, fundamental basic building blocks that the whole of the universe operates on. Science has no idea of their origins and can't really explain what they are, though they obviously have many theories on what perhaps <clears throat> perhaps might be behind it. So science is um, flawed in itself. It, you know, if you listen to a hard-headed atheist, they'll, they'll almost lead you to believe that science is the answer to everything. That science can explain everything and anything and you don't have to worry anymore because we're in this age of science and reason. But that's not really true. <clears throat> of course, it's uncovered many mysteries and I should have been clicking on these um, as we go through, sorry. Um, so, the question of how did life begin is one which science really, and we'll see um, in the videos that we're going to show in a minute, um, it really has nothing to say on how life began. And they're, they're resorted to, to, I find, incredible explanations that are far more outrageous and, and simple-minded than, than the chapters we read tonight. Um, and you might be surprised that you know, even the, the highest levels of intelligence um, accept some pretty bizarre things when it comes to how life began. But this, um, this section on the right-hand side of the screen here is actually from, it's a paraphrase of the limitations of science from um, a page on the Berkeley University. So it's not something I've made up, it's something that a scientist has actually put forward as the limitation of science itself. So science cannot make moral judgments. What does that mean? It means that science can't tell you what's right and wrong. Science can explain how things happen, it can give you information and knowledge, but it can't tell you what's right and wrong. And in fact, if you were to, um, you know, there's this whole study of ethics which is completely outside the domain of science. And it's interesting, if you were to say, perhaps let's obey the rules that the natural world observes, well, there'd be nothing wrong with wives eating their husbands or, you know, murdering your children or, you know, killing someone that's weak and, and devouring them if you're hungry. I mean, this is the way that the natural world works. And there's... God has... A, we, we believe, obviously, that God has, has built these things into the system part after the fall to kind of impress us with the fact that although creation is wonderful and beautiful and intricate and interlinked and interdependent, there's still something fundamentally wrong with it, something that needs fixing. So science can make no, no comment on moral judgments. Science can't make any <clears throat> um, comments on ascetic judgments either, which means science can't tell you whether something is more beautiful than something else, whether some piece of music sounds nicer than something else, whether some piece of food tastes nicer than something else. So all these, you know, wonderful um, domains and, and, and businesses that, that people are engaged in, cooking and food and art and music and literature, completely outside the realm of science. So we're already beginning to see that science is not the answer to everything. In fact, science has a very narrow and precise field of view and everything else um, is outside of its domain. Science can't tell you how to use scientific knowledge, so it can put forward information 
but it's up to us how to interpret and use that knowledge. And also, and probably most importantly for us tonight, science cannot draw conclusions on supernatural explanations. And, and this one here is fundamental. This is a, a real flaw, and it presents a massive problem to um, the scientific community in general who accept evolution, um, because they, observe, they absorb that, that scientific mindset and quite rightly when they say, if you say that God did something, that's unscientific. It's, it's absolutely true. But what if God actually did something? What if God actually created the world? What if God actually parted the Red Sea? Science would... You would expect a scientist in that situation, if you commissioned a group of scientists to go back in time and and observe the phenomena of the parting of the Red Sea, you would expect, and in fact the scientist would fail if he did not arrive at a natural explanation for that event. When in actual fact we know that God did it, that God intervened and caused the waters to part so the children of Israel could pass through. So really what, what we have today when we look at um, evolution and the scientific explanation for how life came to be, we're looking at a group of scientists who are using their field and the limitations of, of the methodology that they've adopted to try and find a natural explanation for something which happened because God intervened and created it. And it's completely beyond the point of view of science. They cannot explain it. They cannot accept. They must not accept that God created because then as a scientist you're effectively saying, I've failed as a scientist. I cannot explain how this came to be. It must have been God that did it. So clearly when we're trying to um, explore the natural world, science has a very important part to play, but we need to have something broader and greater than science, but including science, to observe and explain it. And that's what uh, this group of people that have put this video together um, try to do. And I think hopefully you'll see as we move through a couple of sections of it, that um, they've done a very good job. So the first one we're going to have a look at, um, the video is called Evolution's Achilles Heels. The first section is on genetics. And just to um, give you a bit of a teaser, genetics and the thing that they're talking about, the little amazing machinery and the DNA and the RNA and all these things that they talk about, they're all mechanisms that exist inside every single cell of every living thing. Um, it's not some mechanism that you know, moves up and down your arm or something like that. It's, it's inside every cell, you know, like a, a skin cell, and, and every cell in every muscle of your body has this mechanism. And it's absolutely unbelievable. And I'll, I'll just play it because I, can, I can't do it justice. Actually, I believe genetics is the most powerful argument against evolution. And, uh, and the reason is that when you, when you look at the genes of things, I mean, they, they're transmitted and passed on generation to generation. But the changes you see, the mutations, actually destroy the genes. What biologist does is actually it studies the genetics, the genetic information, the transfer of genetic information, the control of genetic information, or in my field, biotechnology, how to change that intelligently to create something novel. Darwinism has nothing to do with that. The random approach produces nothing. Randomness cannot uh, compete with intelligence in, in understanding nature. I organized a symposium at Cornell University, and the topic was biological information. And all of the scientists agreed on one thing, and that is that information is fundamental to our understanding of what life is. Information is, in a sense, what makes life life. And I'm not just talking about information like data. I'm talking about information networks, communication networks within the cell. One of the most amazing information transfer systems in the cell involves the way proteins are encoded in and decoded from strands of DNA. 
starting out with these long, fragile, sticky strings of DNA, an amazing machine called an RNA polymerase zips down the strand, opens up the coils, and copies the DNA into another molecule called RNA. And RNA uses a slightly different language convention. It still has four letters like DNA, but instead of A, C, G, and T, it has A, C, G, and U. The RNA then leaves a nucleus, and another amazing machine attaches to it. It's called a ribosome, and it is in charge of translating from the language of the RNA with its four letter bases to the language of proteins with their 20 different amino acids. Three bases on the bottom of the tRNA match to three letter groups in the RNA. On the other end are amino acids which pop off as they're attached to the growing protein strand. But the process isn't finished because most proteins need help folding properly. And that's facilitated by little molecules called chaperones. They attach to and protect the unfolded protein as it's transported to a watermelon shaped molecule called a chaperonin, which folds the protein into its final form. From DNA to protein is an incredibly complex process that uses precise and complex machines to translate between two completely unrelated languages, the linear code of the DNA world to the three-dimensional code of the protein world. If we look into these complexities and into these codes in the genome and in the in the, in the working together, the operating system in the cells, then it is very hard to exclude that there hasn't been intelligence behind it. And I think that is what the creationists recognize in these systems. How did this incredible communication network that's even present in the simplest cell, how did it arise? Well, you need three things for it to arise. Number one, you need a language. You can't even conceive of a, a communication system until there's a language because there's senders and receivers in the cell. Secondly, you need uh, communication channels or networks. It's a little bit like the hardware that enables the internet. And thirdly, you have to have meaningful information that is being translated into language and communicated through the channels of communication. information is at the heart of cellular function. Did you know the cell even has a post office? There are these specialized molecules called kinesins, and they're in charge of delivering packets of material to different parts of the cell. But in their journey, they go to pre-specified destinations. Without that addressing system, the cell couldn't even work. Information, communication, and language. They're non-material entities, they arise through intelligence, and they're mutually defining. So you can't have one without the other. They all have to arise at the same time. Yet the information in the genome is much more complicated than we first thought. In fact, the genome contains multiple levels, multiple dimensions of information. Well, start with the one-dimensional string called DNA. Upon this, there's this huge two-dimensional network of interactions amongst different parts of the genome with each other. Then we have to fold the DNA into a three-dimensional shape that changes shape in the fourth dimension, time. To make it even more complicated, it's now known that most parts of the genome code for more than one thing at the same time. Overlapping codes are almost impossible to improve upon because if you improve one of the codes, you are destroying or disrupting one of the other codes. So what I mean by overlapping codes, of course, is that the same sequence of DNA has more than one message. And that is now very, very clear. Most of these overlapping codes are found in the so-called junk DNA. Since only 2% of the genome actually codes for protein, scientists decided decades ago that the rest was unimportant leftover garbage from our evolutionary history. But that view is now seen to be quite naive, as the genomics revolution has shown that non-protein coding portions of the genome are actually quite active, not for creating proteins, but for creating something similar to DNA called RNA which is one of the cellular workhorses and which often affects the production of protein down the line. The junk DNA also contains lots of other codes for controlling many different functions in the cell. So basically, uh, a lot of scientists now understand that the junk DNA paradigm was profoundly wrong and will be recorded in history as one of the greatest blunders of science and it was driven by an ideological commitment to the Darwinian concept. 
Similar to the junk DNA myth is the myth that the human and chimpanzee genomes are 98% identical. That figure has continued to decrease as we learn more about genetics, and the figure is now much less than the earlier estimates. But the number really doesn't matter, because humans and chimpanzees, they look similar, we behave somewhat similarly, we live in the same environments, we eat the same foods. Both the creationists and the evolutionists expect them to be similar genetically. Creationists simply believe it's due to common design, not common ancestry. So yeah, um, <clears throat> hopefully it's not too complicated for you, but I always marvel and wonder at the, the intricacy and the, the complexity of even the smallest of, of living things that God has made. It just makes you wonder and marvel. So what we were looking at there is just one small facet of um, one mechanism inside the cell, and that is just translating the information in the DNA into useful proteins for the cell. And, I mean, I just wondered at, you know, that machine that zips along and, you know, unzips the DNA, creates RNA and um, these things that grab the new code and move it somewhere else and convert it into a 3D structure. It's just unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. You know, and, and what he was talking about there was um, that they honed in on that particular aspect of the cell because it's all to do with, with information. It's all to do with... Um, intelligence. There has to be an intelligence behind an information system. You know, we all are aware and probably all use uh, the internet to some degree. It's almost impossible to exist without it these days, not entirely. But that is an information network. And the same thing on a microscopic level happens inside the cell. There's a language of letters, there's a communication net, a medium for that language to pass through and it, it just it absolutely blows your mind doesn't it that, that on that small level God has designed such an intricately and, and precise form of communication we're going to have a look now at another it just continues right on but it's talking about genetic entropy the, um, the phenomenon that uh, mutations accumulate over time in the human genome and so things are, are going backwards and not forwards like evolutionists would have us believe. Yet, when you consider humans only, it is staggering how similar we all are one to another. And if you exclude recent mutations like sickle cell anemia or hereditary blindness, all those you know, bad things, it, it would be possible to put all the world's human diversity into a single original human couple. But there's a problem, and it doesn't matter if you're looking at the human genome or the chimpanzee genome or any other genome. And the problem is that the information is degrading and mutations are building up in populations over time. So I've been studying genetic entropy for the last 13 years, and it's a really profound problem, and it's something widely acknowledged by geneticists, and it is the problem that bad mutations accumulate in the human genome. And this is best illustrated by just considering it on a personal level. In your body or in my body, we have about three new mutations every time a cell divides. So this is um, sobering because it's the reason we die. And so the reason that uh, we get old and all of our systems start to break down is because of this mutational process and the accumulation of bad mutations in our genome. It's why there's an upper lifespan. Now, the problem is bigger still. Because, of course, we already know that we're mortal. But we transmit a certain fraction of our mutations to our children. And they add more mutations to it, and then they pass it on to their children. And then they add more mutations still, and they add it to the next generation. So this is a problem not just for people, but for the whole human race. And logically, the human race should be devolving, not evolving. Basically, the human race is degenerating the human genome is rusting out like a car. Can natural selection solve this problem? No. Think of a room full of people. Now, kill off only the ones with the worst or most obvious mutations. What do you have left? A room half full of people that still have 60 to 100 more mutations than their parents. If everyone is multiply mutant, and if every generation is more mutant than the one before it, 
All selection can do is slow down the degeneration by killing off the absolute worst of the lot, but it doesn't stop mutations increasing the population over time. So genetic entropy is profound. Not only is it profound because it really has a, impacts us personally and our children and our grandchildren, it's really profound because it is lethal. It is absolutely lethal to genetic evolutionary theory because it means that things are going down, not up. All modern scientific evidence points to the decay and destruction of original good design. If you like, good information getting worse. But where did this good information come from in the first place? How did life begin? Even under an evolutionary scenario, the first cell would have to have been horrendously complex. So that's a pretty um, impressive argument, isn't it? That things are actually accumulating for the worse um, in the human genome alone, and let alone other um, animals as well. <clears throat> so contrary to the, um, the scientific explanation that you know, mutations are the mechanism which create new information and cause us to progress to you know, higher and greater forms of, of development over time. The evidence, as, as these guys are saying, is that things are going in the opposite direction. And it all points to a very simple explanation like we have in, the, you know, in Genesis chapter 1. God saw everything that he had made and it was very good. It started off at the highest and things have only degenerated and got worse over time. We'll move on to um, the next section, natural selection. The first time that I saw a creation presentation on natural selection, I was just amazed at my blindness prior to that in not realising that natural selection can only operate on whatever is existing. And it can only operate to remove what is existing. And so the realisation that it doesn't actually produce new genetic information uh, was an absolute bombshell to me. So natural selection is actually a convenient term to use just to describe this process by which uh, creatures, organisms not suited to the environment are eliminated, those which are suited survive. So natural selection is not the same as evolution. The survival of the fittest does not explain the arrival of the fittest. If natural selection only selects from what's already in the population, then how does evolutionary progress occur? Mutations are the evolutionists hoped for engine of evolution. And if that's true, there should be hundreds of examples that we could see today of mutations increasing the genetic information. Is this Darwinian process, mutation plus selection, is that a creative process? In fact, is that the creative process? And the answer is, it's not a creative process. The mutation selection process is only useful for fine-tuning systems. And that's what we see in biology. If we consider the most common examples of evolution, the ones you see in the textbooks and things, these are not due to some new feature being added, but breaking existing features. For example, uh, warfarin resistance in rats, or DDT resistance in mosquitoes, loss of sight in cave fish and cave salamanders, loss of functional wings in beetles on a windy island. In all these cases, things are broken by mutation and natural selection is involved in selecting them. They're getting rid of them if it happens to be adaptive. But people say, hang on, I see new species appearing. Isn't that a proof of evolution? Well, not really, because it's not a problem for creationists. Both the creation and evolution models predict the appearance of new species. What I mean is that God apparently created animals that were designed to diversify over time. So you, you look at red wolves and gray wolves. Obviously they're wolves. They came from a common ancestor, but all we would say is that they came from two wolf-like creatures that came off of Noah's Ark. Now the real problem is defining what a species is. I mean, keep in mind, species, species is the word, it's a man-made word, and boundaries between species are often blurry.
scientists use the word in multiple ways. I mean, it, geologists, they tend to separate fossils into different species based on the way they look. But biologists sometimes say things belong to the same species if they can interbreed regardless of how they look. If you think about it, both sides of the creation and evolution debate predict the formation of new species. Therefore, even though the appearance of new species is necessary for evolutionary theory, it cannot be proof of evolution if the creationist model can make the same prediction. Let me give you another example. I, I've been to the Galapagos Islands. I, I've seen the marine iguanas and the land iguanas. They, they look different, they act different, they live in different environments, they eat different things. They've been labeled as two distinct, separate species by the evolutionists, and they claim they've been separated for millions of years. Yet hybrid offspring between the two species exists, and they're easy to find, so they look different, but they can interbreed. Obviously, they came from a single founding species that made it to those islands, but are they really separate species? And it's not just among iguanas. We've seen hybridizations between false killer whales and dolphins, donkeys and zebras, polar bears and grizzlies, lions and tigers. And many of these crosses produce fertile offspring. When Darwin went to the Galapagos, he collected information about finches and he was looking for change over time. It wasn't until quite some time later, thinking about it, he realised the finches he saw there probably, almost certainly, were derived from finches on the mainland. But they're just variations of finches. And in fact, today we know that many of them can interbreed, so they shouldn't even be called different species. So this is not an example of evolution in a sense of microbes to mankind. Darwin's basic concept in his tree diagram was a tree of life, that all living things today go back to one common ancestor. But creationists have the idea, our idea is that uh, we can trace things back to basic kinds, not one, but many different basic kinds that were created and they've adapted and speciated and so on to give what we see today. So instead of a tree, creationists see it more of an orchard where each tree in the orchard is a basic kind from which the branches actually are the species and things we see today. And ad adaptation and natural selection are involved in that process. I think that nature has been created to be able to modify itself and fitting the circumstances where living organisms are. We see a lot of variation potential in nature, but real novelties are not there. People talk about different species and speciation in nature. That's something that we can observe, but it uh, is not the same thing as creating novel structures, novel information. I don't see that. You can imagine that you have a, a front-loaded organism with all these, these genes, and you can then argue that, okay, in this particular environment, you can lose that part of genes in the other environment with with other selection pressure, with other conditions, you can lose another part, another set of the genes. While it's true that mutations can sometimes create new traits, they generally only work to destroy existing traits and information. So when a new trait called sickle cell anemia arose in Africa, it allowed people to survive malarial infections. It was a new trait, but the hemoglobin gene was broken in the process. Likewise, many examples of antibiotic resistance of bacteria deal with broken genes for transporting things into the cell. The reason that the bacteria can live is because the transporter gene is broken, the poison can't get in. It's easier to break something than to create something new. Natural selection plus mutation actually works in the wrong direction for evolution. So the question is, how does evolution work? So again, there's some remarkable observations there to do with um, you know, one of the, the favourites of the evolutionary explanation, natural selection. And um, some of the, the closing thoughts there that, that the, the man had were remarkable. And it suggests that God created um, the basic kinds that we saw in Genesis, not just as a static um, animal that would always stay exactly the same, but able to adapt 
and um, um, adapt to its environment, uh, whether it's a hot or a cold climate or a windy or whatever climate. And this natural selection process, um, rather than adding new information, is really stripping away information that, that would otherwise be useful in a different environment, but in the particular environment is not needed. For example, he had the, the flightless bird, um, or the beetle with no wings, uh, in a windy island. So, um, a remarkable section, and again, we're seeing um, the explanation that God gave right back in the beginning is, is um, more relevant than ever before. You know, that the suggestion that instead of a tree of life that all begins at a single point, what we see in nature is actually an orchard. It's, it's fixed species that cannot jump across and bridge the gap, but they can diversify because God in his wisdom created them with that ability. So let's just uh, look at the last little section I wanted to show you tonight on the origin of life and um, the real lack of explanation that science has for this particular question, where did life begin? It's not sufficient to invoke scenarios where I could imagine biochemicals arising spontaneously. Life isn't based upon biochemicals. You can have all the biochemicals you want, and it's not going to give you life. You can have all the amino acids you want. You can have all the proteins you want. You can add RNA to the soup. You can add DNA to the soup. You can even add membranes to the soup. But number one, they will never assemble into a coherent, correctly assembled cell. And even if they could, you still wouldn't be anywhere near creating life because you have not introduced into those molecules information. Now think about information in the form of books, which is ink molecules written on paper. The information didn't come from the ink molecules. You could pour ink on a page and you would not get a book out of it because the information in the books is the result of a mind organizing those ink molecules into letters and words, sentences and paragraphs. For instance, the simplest living cell, the mycoplasma, has about 600 kilobytes of information. It's like an alphabet. The letters do not say anything at all. It has to be in, a, in the right uh, position and it has to be interpreted and that is what is going on in, this, in the cells of living beings. You see, there's nothing in chemistry alone that will put any sort of coded information into a molecule. I mean, even if you could get nucleotides to form in a chemical soup, and even if you could get them to form a chain, you'd have nothing but a random string of letters. If you were to wait for a very long time and by chance produce a coherent string with a real instruction, even then, it would be just one clear message in a sea of random messages. This is the opposite of what life requires. Life requires lots of information, tightly controlled and protected, able to be copied, able to be fixed when an error appears. And all of this must be present the first time life appears. When the DNA was first decoded, and they, the scientists started looking at the simplest living cell, they imagined that possibly, possibly, we could have a cell with a couple of hundred proteins. Well, it's up to over 400 now. And even the origin of one of these proteins by some chance process, it's not gonna happen even on a universal time scale. And even if every atom in the universe was an experiment for every possible molecular vibration of a supposed billions of years of time, you would never get one protein, let alone hundreds, let alone the DNA, to actually code for them. I mean, the idea of the origin of life by natural processes is a preposterous idea, absolutely preposterous idea. Many evolutionists claim that the origin of life is not part of evolution, but come on, they believe that all living things came from a single cell, which in turn came from a primordial soup. So they have to have a theory of life coming from non-living chemicals, otherwise materialism is dead in the water. So the evolutionists to believe in chemical evolution, this is not a position they got from science, but a position they got from blind faith. They're basically having to believe in miracles because it's not real chemistry that they can appeal to. The evolutionists often accuse creationists of believing in a God of the gaps, where they say that we claim God just did it that way when we run into some process that we don't quite understand. But very often when faced with an unanswerable question, a problem like the origin of life, 
Evolutionists invoke their own Darwin of the gaps. See, everything we know about the laws of chemistry, about genetics and statistics and information theory argues against any life from non-life idea. But an evolutionist must believe that scientific laws are violated for life to arise from non-living chemicals. That sounds like faith to me. I think one of the biggest challenges for evolution is the origin of the first life. Life supposedly coming forth from a chemical soup. Scientists have had decades to reproduce this in a laboratory, but they haven't been able to do that, despite all the time they've had, despite all the great equipment. And I think that's tremendous evidence that life can't evolve from a chemical soup. Many evolutionists admit that life from non-living chemicals is a huge problem for life on Earth. So they've resorted to the idea that maybe life came from outside the Earth, and this is called panspermia. Now, there are two versions of this one. One is undirected, which just says that chemical evolution happened somewhere and life was naturally seeded onto Earth somehow. Now, this doesn't actually solve the problem of life from the living chemicals. It just puts it into the unknown. In fact, it puts it beyond science. So you might say it's a Darwin of the gaps theory, not science at all. Another idea is called directed panspermia, where you have intelligent aliens seeding life from outer space onto Earth. Francis Crick, the primary discoverer of DNA, is one of those scientists who realized it can't happen spontaneously. So he, like other scientists, are imagining that intelligent life from outer space brought life to Earth, and they find that more credible than the idea of spontaneous origin of life. Evolutionists who resort to directed panspermia are in fact tacitly conceding that life was intelligently designed. The only difference is their designer is an alien, not the god of the Bible. So, I mean, if you'd, if you'd possibly thought that um, science was a little bit on the back foot as you went through some of these sections, well, I find this last section absolutely remarkable. You know, that where did life begin? The most fundamental question. And, you know, Francis Crick, the discoverer of DNA, or I think that's what they said, um, he resorts to this explanation. Perhaps an alien came along and just, um, you know, injected life into a, into a soup on Earth and then flew on his merry way to do something else somewhere else. I mean, it's just unbelievable, isn't it? Willing ignorance. And yet, you know, we'd be led to believe that there's just overwhelming evidence and no one, no one accepts the, the Bible's explanation whatsoever. But really, this simple and elegant explanation does away with so many problems that, that evolutionary explanation um, just fails to, to explain. You know, the chicken and egg problem, if you like. There's so many chicken and egg problems when it comes to evolution, including the chicken and the egg, which one came first. And they all go away when you understand that God created everything as a working system which relied and, and interoperated in a beautiful way and in his wisdom was able to adapt to the various environments over time that God knew would, would present themselves. So our explanation that God is the creator and that he wonderfully made all that we see around us is not lazy. It's not something that you know, we need to be ashamed of at all. I mean, yes, we should have a reasonable and a rational and a logical explanation for people that ask us, but we also shouldn't be ashamed when perhaps what we believe, because we believe that the Bible said it, um, makes us look like an idiot. We, we shouldn't care. And really, when you tease it out, the evidence is all in our favour. We're not such simpletons after all. And no matter how intelligent you know, scientists might appear and how threatening their credentials, we have nothing to be afraid of. Uh, there's always the, the classic example of um, a court of law. You know, we might be intimidated to think that um, 
we can't question the conclusions of very intelligent and qualified people, but in a court of law, they establish the two sides of the argument and they're teased out by professionals who are experts in their field. All the evidence is brought forward, but the grand conclusion and, and the, the weight of the evidence is all evaluated by common, everyday people, the jury, people called up at random from all walks of life. The whole judgment rests on them. And we also have been blessed with, by God, the ability to logically evaluate things. And we shouldn't care so much whether it's someone incredibly intelligent and qualified or whether it's someone you know, lowly and humble. We can still evaluate the message that they give and accept it or discard it based on the message itself and not who's saying it. So hopefully you've been encouraged a bit tonight by, by some of the things we've looked at tonight and um, strengthened in your faith, encourage that we really aren't simpletons <laughs> after all, um, and the rest of the world, I guess the best explanation is what God says there in Romans chapter 1, they really are without excuse.